All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're doing well. This is the agenda for our meeting here today, March 24th. I'm gonna hold this here for a little while so that you can see that the questions that we need to address for assignment number two are listed in the middle there under number three. I will, of course, show this again sometime later in the video, but I wanted to start here. We're gonna welcome, we'll do that here in a moment, obviously, and then we're gonna discuss a little bit about the first assignment and how things went move on after that to talk about the second assignment and then we'll cover the material from today's lesson but for now there's the questions hopefully you got a chance to see those if not please just rewind the video and then freeze it there all right let's switch this about there yeah all right ladies and gents so welcome i hope that this whole corona quarantine world has not found you in any way harmed or sick or those that you care about and love sick in any way uh it is a weird world um just a very bizarre situation i was saying to my 14 year old son the other day that i i've never encountered anything like this in my life that uh, the sacrifice he's being asked to make and just sort of being closed indoors is tough for a young person and uh, it's tough for an old person. So it's tough for everybody. So I, I apologize on behalf of Mother Nature or whoever caused this thing. And I hope we are all well soon. I hope you are, are resting and enjoying life. All right, let's get going. So number two says reminder of format, discussion of first assignments. Uh, I'll go over the material for today, uh, talking primarily today about the War of 1812. We're going to talk about the rise of antebellum sectionalism. We'll also talk about a couple of events right at the end of our unit here that bring us up to the presidency of Andrew Jackson next week. Uh, but there are three questions for this week. Like we did last week, I will put those into Canvas as an assignment. I think people did a great job in answering the questions the first week. Um, I'm still missing, I ballpark it at about 10 people, 10 out of maybe 32, 33 people still in the class. A little concerned there, I'm going to get in touch with those folks and see if everything's okay. But part of me thought that perhaps people thought it wasn't due until today, Tuesday, March 24th, because that's the day the class would normally meet. So I might give it another 12 or 24 hours or so. Obviously, right now, I'm not that concerned about late work in that sense. I just want to see that people are still here in the class turning things in. I would be, I'd be bummed for you, for the lack of a better word, if because of our switch to an online format, you went from someone who was able to get to class and succeed in the class to being someone who could not succeed in the class. So I want to make sure that that's not the case for anybody. Uh, really, there's, there's no gap for error there. We can't have anyone fall into that hole. Um, on that note then, uh, I heard a lot of positive feedback about doing things this way. Uh, people saying that it's nice to be able to wind the video back in order to hear it again if you missed a point or to, to have a nice set of all of the ideas. So I'm glad that this is working out. I don't know how this would look in a real online long-term forum. I imagine there's a lot more that goes into it. This is more of a MacGyvered form of things and it's, it's a little bit different in that sense. So hopefully this has worked for you. But if you do have any questions or issues, as always, please contact me. My email was on the sheet of paper I showed as the agenda at the beginning of things. So please uh, reach out and hit me up if there's anything going on there. But otherwise, if there are no other issues, uh, let us turn our focus to the agenda of the material for the evening. Okay. I have my slides in front of me. Tonight we're starting out with slide number nine, uh, which is the one with the War of 1812 on it. And then we are continuing our way through the Missouri Compromise. So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I think is our last slide here. And then that brings us again to the presidency of Andrew Jackson for next week. Uh, the, the questions for this week do uh, Monday evening, next Monday evening, uh, March the 30th, that'll be. And I will put that assignment on Canvas uh, later on today. So again, hope you're well. Let's roll. The War of 1812, often referred to as the Second War of Independence by many historians because it's the moment where the British will finally leave the young America on its own to do its thing. If you'll remember from our last week of context, the British have been pestering the Americans on two fronts both on the high seas through the impressment and stealing of American ships and sailors, and then also in the far west by helping Native Americans to plot against the United States and limit American expansion, both of which 
is something that upsets the Americans. Now, the greater backdrop of this is the Napoleonic War. Britain and France are at war in Europe over control of the entire continent, and America is a bit of a pawn in that game. We really are quite a small player, but American shipments over the Atlantic to either of the two powers, Britain or France, is seen as being troublesome for the other side. In other words, American shipments to Britain, that's upsetting to France. American shipments to France, likewise upsetting to Britain. So they attack our vessels in an effort to try and control the overall scope of the war. If they can keep materials from going to their enemy, then that's going to help them to, in the long run, hopefully be a little bit more successful. Now, hold on, my phone thinks it's running out of battery. Eventually, I'm going to plug it in here. So I apologize for that when it happens, but we'll take a break for 10 seconds and then you can watch me do that. But here we go. Uh, if, if I'm the British and the French, then America isn't a grand power and I'm not worried about them in that sense, but I'm just trying to strengthen my war effort by weakening my opponents. The war that begins in America in the War of 1812 does not go well for us. The United States gets hosed and schooled in the first few years of the battle, and that's really because we're fighting against a superior military foe, and this time we're fighting them without much help. Last time when we really fought the British, we had the help of the French, if you'll remember. But the French are far too busy fighting the rest of the world in, in Europe. Napoleon is coming to the end of his rope after the unsuccessful invasion of Russia. And there isn't much left as, as far as the French and resources go. So America is not going to be able to count on that this time. America had hoped that this might be a war of expansion. Hey, let's go pick up Canada. Uh, let's perhaps take, perhaps take the Spanish territories of Florida and aid that to the American bounty. And unfortunately, those efforts stall very quickly in the war. And the war turns into a bit of a debacle. You know, there's a lot of great famous moments in this war. If you remember, this is where the, the British set fire to the White House very briefly. Uh, this is where, unfortunately, a lot of Americans are routed out of major cities. And the war really ends not with an American triumphant moment, but with the settlement of the English and French hostility abroad. Translation, once the English and the French have settled the Napoleon problem abroad, there's no real reason for the American war to go on. If you're Britain, you've been fighting France now for a solid decade and a half. You have no reason to continue fighting in America. And so the treaty that ends the War of 1812 is actually signed at the end of 1814, but the most significant battle that happens in our scheme of things happens early in 1815 at the Battle of New Orleans. And that is where Andrew Jackson, sort of son of the frontier, rises to the American mindset. Now, we got to keep an eye on Jackson because Jackson will be back next week. Jackson is a military hero. He's going to make his name really conquering Native American tribes and in this case conquering the English at the Battle of New Orleans, but he is, in essence, the next chapter of America. If you look at the American presidents and you go Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, that's a little bit of a stretch holiday, I know, okay? But those first six presidents really represent the old core of the revolution. Those are all, all revolutionary founding souls, with the exception of John Quincy. Jackson is the next breed the next group of individuals who are going to come along. And Jackson will sell you as a different kind of fellow. Jackson's going to say, all of those guys before me, those are sort of intellectual, well-to-do, elite fellows. I'm a common man. Now, Jackson's a pretty wealthy guy by the time he runs for president, so let's put that idea on the shelf. But he's going to convince you that he is, in essence, the average person brought to life and making the presidency about his his average person, right? Now, what we'll look at with next week in Jackson is the national appeal of his name. And in the early days of the Americas, one of the ways that you want to get your name out there is the military. If you can have a triumphant military moment, it's going to perhaps help you get to the presidency, like Andrew Jackson, for instance. Or uh, later on, we'll see a president named William Henry Harrison, who rises to fame on the Battle of Tippecanoe, which is uh, a battle during the War of 1812. We're going to see Zachary Taylor uh, rise to the president as a uh, rise, I beg your pardon, to the presidency, uh, largely due to his efforts in winning the Mexican-American War. Okay. The point being, Jackson is the one individual who walks out of the War of 1812 and can say, I am a popular figure, 
And as a result of it, the nation is going to know my name. Now, it's early days. It's about 10 years before he really becomes a household presidential name. But at this point, people know him. There's a reputation there. And that will later on build. If you're looking for a sweet song, by the way, let me just throw this out here because I know you're always looking for song suggestions, especially you young folk. You've got your hip songs that you listen to. The Rebel Johnny Horton, The Ballad of New Orleans. That is a dang good song. You go listen to that song and you'll be like, this, this is the business. And then once you've heard that, you can go on to some other Rebel Johnny Horton classics. Uh, Horton, for the record, was a 1950s country western act. Uh, so, some real classic songs out there. So now that I have given you the future of your Spotify playlist, let's move along. Okay. Number two slide here is... The election in 1820, and I'm going to look at my slide. Hopefully, you're looking at yours as well. This is an absolute destruction. Notice who's not here. The Federalist Party. The Federalist Party has finally run out of the last ugh, of gas that it had. It has absolutely been pushed into extinction. And that year, the Democratic Republican Party, the party of Thomas Jefferson, which has been dominating these presidential races since 1800 now, runs James Monroe. Now, Monroe had been elected in 1816. This is a re-election campaign. And as you can tell, he does pretty well. Now, did he almost win them all? He did. There's one representative, one electoral college representative who cast his vote for John Quincy Adams. And in doing so, does one of two things. There's two historical thoughts here. One is that the guy who cast that vote was such a fan of John Quincy Adams that he gave John Quincy Adams the vote as a way of saying, I'm here for you. Now, in all fairness, John Quincy will go on to win the next presidential election. More on that next week. But the other school of historical thought is that that elector is keeping an eye on the greater picture. And the greater picture is this. Nobody has ever gone Electoral college score and zero for your opponent except for George Washington. And there's, there's considerable thought that we don't want anyone to have that distinction, especially James Monroe. Hmm, okay. Uh, so really what you're looking at here is probably an attempt to assure that Monroe doesn't scratch his name into the legacy of presidents and be like, me and George Washington. That's, that's really the squad. Me, George Washington, that's all you'd ever need. Okay. Yeah, Monroe. Okay, but what I want you to see here, look how much the nation has grown. We've added new states in Indiana and Illinois and Missouri, southern states in Mississippi and Louisiana, and they are all, all, all Thomas Jefferson states. Wall-to-wall -wall ruling for Thomas Jefferson's party. Doing well there. The third slide here is a couple of images, and I want us to take a few things away from it. So hopefully, again, you have the slide in front of you. Number one. Notice the strength of cotton over time. The phrase used to describe cotton is king cotton, K-I-N-G, in case it's not clear when I say it there, king cotton, because it is, by 1860, about 60% of the exports of the United States. And this is one of the real murky bits for American history is that you want to say, well, slavery is a horrendous institution. Southern slavery that's used in order to make cotton is something that is inhumane and we should get rid of it. The problem there is that if you're a northern textile manufacturer, as many big elite northerners were, your livelihood was dependent upon that southern cotton. There's no more powerful economic item in the American arsenal by the mid-19th century than cotton. And when we get to the Civil War, that'll play some advantage for the Southerners. But leading up to the Civil War, the debate over what to do with slavery is largely shadowed by how do we move the economy on? In other words, if we were to get rid of slavery, could we still provide the world with this abundance of cheap cotton or would we be shooting ourselves in the foot economically by doing the right thing from a humane standpoint? That's the big question a lot of the abolitionists and on the other hand, the slave owners have to think about as they're considering what to do with the future of cotton. Now, looking at that bottom slide, I want us to notice how deeply the slave areas spread. So if you look at the left-hand one, you have only a couple of areas where there's real darkness. Okay, let's look at them. That southern one, the one on the, the lower portion, 
is the South Carolina rice plantations. That's, that's what's growing there, okay? Long been highly profitable areas. And really, when we look at the early part, the colonial history of the United States, the early republic, that's the most dense slave population in America. South Carolina had the most slaves as compared to free people of any of the states. The other one here is Virginia there in the eastern part of Virginia, a little bit north of it. Okay? And that's where you would have a huge uh, tobacco, but more and more so cotton plantation society going on. And over time, watch it grow, right? So when I come back to this other map here in 1860, I'm looking at a long stretch that goes all the way from the eastern portion of Texas. Is that part of the United States holiday? That will be. Give us a couple of weeks. That'll be part of it. But across what was known as kind of the, the Black Belt, and that was called that because the soil in the area was so rich, so fertile, that it was considered to be the most potent cotton soil in the world. And really, from this region of America, this bottom portion, the Deep South, places like Mississippi, Texas, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, you get the deep southern seven states where the slave institution and cotton is going to be such an important part of the economy. I mention it here because what we get to later on tonight is largely a discussion about sectional disagreement. That is to say north versus south. And that debate rages over primarily an economic footing. It's going to be northerners looking at the south and southerners looking at the north and saying how I make my money defines how I politically think. And that makes sense, right? Think of Kern County in essence. Kern County is big in ag, big in oil. And, and we're defensive of those institutions. I don't really work in either of those things, but I'm dependent for my livelihood upon them. And I know that they bring great things to the people here of the valley. People in Sacramento might disagree. People who have more of an environmental look at things might say, well, farming, the air, the water, I don't know, oil, bad for the environment. But when I look at it from my sectional view, that is to say, as a resident of the Central Valley, whose prosperity and happiness is dependent upon the success of the local economy, I'm pro those industries. Now, someone else who isn't dependent upon that economy might differ from me. Right? That idea of sectional views, really how an area's po politics, I beg your pardon, is defined by their regional opinions, that's a big part of our later discussion. And I wanted us to see this map here so we understood just how deeply rooted the slave institution is in those areas. Okay? The Deep South is going to rely on slavery and really primarily cotton in order to make its money. All right. Next slide, the war for textiles. On this slide, I've got two columns. On the left-hand side, I want to talk about why the British are so dominant in the textile industry. And then on the right-hand side, I want to talk about how the United States is going to try and scratch its way into the game. And this is the, the first big market of goods. Because when we say textiles, what we're saying is the cotton we get out of the South brought north into northern manufacturing plants and made into thread, yarn, whatever it is, and then processed into some sort of textiles. Shirts, pants, uh, undergarments, socks, gloves, hats, all of those things. Textiles are the big early trade of America's industry, and it's what the English have been doing primarily for the last 100 years or so. All right, so let's look at it. What is going well for Great Britain? Number one, they've been doing it longer than anyone else. And with that comes an enormous curve of experience. The British dominance of the textile trade is based on the fact that they're greedy with their technology. They're not going to share it. You, you shouldn't, right? If you develop a, a new iPhone, whatever they're sitting on the shelf with now, the iPhone 28, they're not going to go to Samsung and say, hey guys, on the next one, this is what we're going to have. You may want to do that too. No one's going to do that. that. That'd be a ridiculous thing to do from a financial standpoint. So the English are incredibly greedy with their technology. But they've also, over the course of time, earned that. They've worked out the kinks. You start out simple, and then early on, it's like water power and steam power. And over time, they have gotten better and better and better at harnessing power and in creating machines that create these textiles. And there's a proprietary nature to it. They don't want to share it with anyone. Think about it. America didn't even get it. When we were a colony back in the day, I don't know how, how many weeks ago that is, but let's go a few. When we were a colony, we didn't get those things. The British didn't, for instance, build textile mills in America. 
They built textile mills in Liverpool and in Manchester. They didn't build them in America because they didn't want the United States to have any kind of textile advantage over Britain. We are a colony. Our job is to provide raw materials. The British will do the fine work. So they're a very closely guarded set of ideas and secrets when it comes to the textile trade. Okay. My phone's telling me it's like 10%. I am amazed how quickly it goes down when I make these videos. I thought I had enough juice, but for about 15 seconds, I'm gonna plug this in. I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee. You do the same, I suppose. Give me a sec. Oh, I tried to pull the camera with it, you pesky little charger. All right, we're back. Okay, so we're talking about how the British are incredibly stingy at things. Okay, I've mentioned already they have a lot of experience. I've mentioned that they are uh, stingy when it comes to not letting the technology out. Next point, a well-established infrastructure. I say here cheaper shipping and better banking systems. The British have far more ships than the United States does or any other country for that matter. And they also have an established banking system that's been working on building this empire now for well over 100 years. And what that adds up to is a system of effective trade and manufacturing that has some depth to it. America is step one, right? We are basically coming out of the Revolutionary War for the first time being allowed our full technological capability and we are almost embryonic in our youth, trying to compete against an established world power. It is going to be incredibly difficult for the United States to get our footing, and the British will be punks about it. Let's be fair. Of course they are. They're going to make sure that they do everything possible to make our industry work as poorly as possible. How can they do that? Well, they can dump cheap textiles onto our market, right? As America tries to build textiles, we're probably not gonna be very good at it early on. So our prices are gonna be higher and the British are just gonna flood the American market with cheap textiles in order to try and convince American buyers, why would I ever buy American? The British one's cheaper, it's more established. It, it's not a nationalist loyalty issue. I'm loyal to how many dollars are in my wallet. I'm just gonna buy the cheaper one instead of buying the one that maybe is made in the USA in that sense. That goes on a lot still today. So the British are going to use their economic strength against us in that way. A very difficult road for the United States climbing up the hill against the British. They also have a larger pool of cheap labor. The British have an enormous amount of people who are being pushed off of the countryside as the British get better at farming in order to push them into these manufacturing facilities. Now, America will we'll catch up here. Okay, The population of the United States, as far as immigrant labor goes, is quite low, but that's going to get bigger and bigger every generation. If you look at the early American establishment, we are doubling the generation or doubling the population, I beg your, beg your pardon, every generation for something like 12 successive generations. It's unbelievable how many people will come to the United States and the birth rate in America is quite strong too. So there will be workers eventually. We're behind in this category. Give us a minute, okay? Let's talk about what the United States has going for it. Number one, what we still have today. The largest, most resplendent, magnificent piece of turf ever laid upon the earth, the United States of America. Okay, a little over the top, I get it. But we have a lot of land. The United States still today chiefly contributes to the world economy, things you have to grow. That's what we're good at. We have a wonderful uh, climate for it. We have great soil. We have enormous amounts of space, and that's what we had in the 1790s going for us. I mentioned here rivers, and if you look at the picture I have here, I, I know this is going back and forth between the slide, but have a look at the picture. That's the first textile mill in America. Now, obviously, that's not a picture from back in the 1790s. There's cars in this one. You saw that, though. Yeah. So th that textile mill was built there on the crook of that river. Notice how the river's kind of coming around, it's turning. And as it turns, the speed and the force, the acceleration right there of that river is gonna come around that corner. There's gonna be a lot of whoosh energy, for the lack of a better word. The energy from the water is going to be harnessed by a long spindle, okay? A long water wheel that's going to run or off of the power it gets from 
the, the river, right? If you take that line where you can see the water falling and you can see that goes straight into the spine of that factory, okay? This mill here is going to run off of the energy we collect from that river. And there are a lot of those in the New England area. Very short, quickly downhill rivers that provide a lot of energy, right? You, you don't want here huge rivers. Those are tougher to harness because they're so wide. Yeah, you need shorter ones, quickly downhill. In a sense, the Kern River would be a great one because the Kern River is not overly wide in any area. And it also comes downhill at a very quick rate. That's what makes it such a great rafting river during the summers when there's water in it and when it's snowed. It's, uh, you know, a world-class area for, for rafting and for kayaking and all of that business because that river is going so fast, okay? But that's one of the, the things America has going for us. Number two, the tariff, okay? Before we go anywhere, let's make sure we understand what a tariff is and how it can be helpful. A tariff is a tax on foreign products. So let's say, for instance, that the dominant trade in the world is in blue tape. Blue tape is the dominant thing. And America is trying to get into the blue tape trade. The easiest way for us to establish some sort of a presence is to protect domestic blue tape. That is to say, blue tape made in America. Here's how we do that. We protect this product by raising the price of our competitor. No, I don't have a second roll of blue tape, but just for a, ma a moment, imagine that this is some foreign blue tape here. Looks just like foreign blue tape. When it arrives, it's going to be cheaper than the price of our domestic blue tape. Now, the only way that I can help the situation is to raise the price of this one here, the foreign blue tape, to the point where our domestic blue tape is now a better price. That's the point of a tariff, raising the price of a foreign good to incentivize the purchase of a domestic good. Okay, hopefully that made sense. We're not talking about blue tape, obviously, though, in 1800. We're talking about textiles. And really, early manufacturing is going to be based around this use of the tariff. America needs it. Alexander Hamilton had said so in his national banking plan of the 1790s that you had to have a protective tariff to protect American industry. What you're doing there is trying as best as possible to drive foreign prices up and then assure that there is a market for the cheaper domestic good. Now, this issue of the tariff is a smoking controversial issue. If, if Americans are going to fight about something between 1800 and the Civil War, they're going to fight about slavery. But if they're not going to fight about slavery, the tariff is what they're going to fight about. So there'll be more about the tariff later on tonight. Just hold on to our, our horses there. What else do we have going for us? Ingenuity. Guys like Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. And not that that one invention makes all the difference. It certainly does in the cotton world. But we also have a very free spirit of entrepreneurial Americans who are out here inventing things and uh, doing their best to kind of make the world anew. You know, names like John Deere uh, that are seen as household names today. This is the period of time where we're going to start seeing those names and their inventions. Sam Slater. Slater is a sweet story. Uh, he figures out how to build the first American textile mill, and he does so by stealing the idea from the English. He goes to England. He poses as almost a philanthropist author, and he is allowed to look around the inside of one of these English textile manufacturing plants on the idea that he's going to write this wonderful tract talking about how good factory work is for the human soul. <laughs> good one. And really, over the course of time, he's not doing anything like that. What is he doing? He's memorizing. And he's looking around. And at the end of the night, he goes home. After about 90 days, he had what he needed. He bopped off to America. And there comes the first mill. It's a beautiful plan. And I imagine whoever the guy in England was who got hoodwinked by him was like, Whoa, well played. All right. That's the first page. Chunk. I made that. That went in the basket. You don't think it did, but it did. I promise. Pardon me. Another sip of coffee. Here we go. That makes it look like I'm not socially distancing. I drive through that. I did. I did. I still shouldn't have gone anyway, though. Duh. Right. I mean, you got a fair point. If you looked at that and you went, <gasps> I hear you. I heard your <clears throat> through the through the video thingy. There we go. The next slide asks us the pretty pivotal question. Who's about to do the work here? 
And the plan that they come up with is, is ingenious and also at the same time kind of curious. All right. They're not going to use slaves. If in your brain you're thought, why don't they just use slaves? Keep in mind that these manufacturing textile plants, they're in the northern states. Those are the states who after the revolution had either immediately, like Massachusetts banned slavery, or gradually, like say in New Jersey, phased slavery out over time. But in the northern states, you're not going to find slaves. So if you thought slaves, that's not the answer. The earliest answer is New England farm girls. In the town of Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, the idea here was to bring these farm girls in and have them work in the factories. Now, these farm girls were, generally speaking, somewhere in the late teens to early 20s. They were women who were, in essence, kind of between two spots. A little too old to be hanging around on the farm still. Uh, and at the same point, not yet marriageable in the sense that they weren't old enough or perhaps their families didn't have enough money, enough of a dowry, if you like, to offer to make them a, a marriable young woman. So here's what you have then. We'll take these girls, they'll go to these factory towns, like Lowell is the best example, and they will work in these factories, and over a course of time, they'll make enough money to send home to Ma and Pa and Susie and Joe, and then those families will make money off of that essentially, and these girls will get a good experience. Now, one of the big portions of this is you have to make sure you take care of this girl. You can't have her show up in this New England town and go crazy because that would not, not do. Keep in mind that part of our, our plan here is to marry this young woman off, and if word gets around that while she was in Lowell, things were a little too spicy, then marrying her off is going to be a more and more difficult prospect. That sounds horrendous to say, but let's just be honest, that's the way they would have thought about these things. And so you have to make sure that that's not what's happening. Okay, that means she's going to need a curfew, she's going to need strict supervision, security, we're gonna to have to make sure she goes to church, there's gonna be like reading and writing lessons and, and violin, um, you know, concerto type things. We are going to culture your daughter. And then she's going to arrive back after a stretch of years, how long, that's kind of up to you, and then you're going to be able to marry her off. That's what the plan looks like on paper. Now, in the reading this week, you're going to read uh, one of the young women who would tell you that the story is a lot harsher than that. And that's one of the problems with this system is that it is incredibly monotonous. It doesn't really acknowledge what variety would like to be. I right? think about a farm girl's life. I'm not trying to romanticize it in a sense, but it would have been a varied thing. There's a variety of different chores I do each day, and there's probably some things that come along, and now I have to solve this particular problem that didn't happen yesterday, or this one that didn't happen the day before. But if I work in a factory, make no bones about it, the more efficient the factory is, the better this is going to work. So it might be that my job all day long is the putting together of these two parts, and then it moves on like that. Now, that was fun, that was a real treat to do that one time, but to do it thousands of times on a daily basis, that's going to eventually make for an incredibly monotonous, boring activity. So one of the weak portions of this plan is that the young women who did it, a lot of the time, didn't wanna be there. Either they were pushed there by societal pressure, family pressure, economic pressure, and once they got there, a lot of them were like, oh my gosh. The conditions here are rank, no thank you. So what's gonna change that? Well, a couple of things are gonna change this. Number one, economics don't support it. You can't take these young women and prop up their jobs with extra money thrown in for room and board and security and all of that and hope to be competitive, right? Because at the end of the day, when I do all of those things and I sell you a shirt, the cost of all of those things is in the shirt. You're eventually buying a shirt, but you're buying the idea of a system that helps out these young girls as well. That's all well and good, but economically it's a nightmare because across the ocean in England, that's not how it's going for them. The textile manufacturing plants of England are not that interested in the health, the safety, the well-being, the overall reputation of the, the people involved. We don't care. The factory opens at this hour and it closes at that hour. You will be here to work and you will work this many hours and you will do this job and we will pay you this wage and we will try and pay you the lowest possible wage we can. 
that's the way you make a cheap shirt. So from an American standpoint, the problem is that we need a cheaper set of workers. That sounds horrendous. Of course it does. What's going to solve that? You're going to start seeing these waves of immigrants again coming across the Atlantic. This time it's going to be from Ireland. And so the earliest textile manufacturing push for Americans early 19th century is going to be a lot of Irish immigrants who arrive in America and work in those factories. Okay, that's going to be our kind of urban destination. Okay? You're looking for a movie to watch? Oh, the Gangs of New York. Now, fair warning, that's a rated R film. But Leonardo DiCaprio, the guy who played Lincoln in the Lincoln movie, Daniel Day-Lewis, there it is. Okay, That is a gory movie. I'll warn you, it's kind of, but it's good. Talks about sort of like Irish immigrants in New York City during the 1840s, 50s. Oh, it's good stuff. Good stuff. In case you want to check out a movie. All right. On to a big slide. This is the most important slide of the day. So let's get our brains in the right place. Let's take a sip of coffee. Feeling good. Here we go. Antebellum sectionalism. Let's define both of those terms. Antebellum. To break that word up, anti, before, bellum, war. So antebellum is a word that could be used for any society's history. It, it would mean the period prior to the war. But in American history, it is used to describe the period really after the United States is formed and up to the Civil War. So if I say the antebellum America, I'm talking about the period really after about 1800, let's say, and up to 1860 when Abraham Lincoln is elected and it all breaks apart. Okay, so that's the antebellum period. Sectionalism. A view of America that isn't nationalist, that isn't rah-rah, one big country, we're all on the same side, but instead is a view of the country that is fostered around this general idea of saying, I believe that my region of the country has something in particular that makes it special. Okay, now... I included here again the next slide. If you'll notice, the next slide is the same 1820 map because I want to I want to put a juxtaposition going here. If you look at that 1820 map, the one we've already looked at, so if you have it in your brain, so be it. But that's the map where you see this wall-to-wall -wall victory for James Monroe in that second term. That would make you think that the United States is very much on a level. In fact, there's this phrase historians use to describe this called the era of good feelings, where after... The War of 1812, we finally pushed the English out. We're building industry, one political party, everyone's feeling good about things. Not necessarily the case, though, because generally speaking, there's a lot of disagreement on a regional level or on a sectional level, as we're calling it. So what are these sections, Holiday? Let's go. The South. The South really is going to put its political ideals behind the institution of slavery. Slavery is its most important asset as far as an economic structure goes. So if I'm a Southerner, I will see national politics through the lens of slavery. Let me put that another way. You want to go to war against a foreign power to expand the United States of America. Okay. Here's what a Southerner is going to say. What does that get me? How much slave land do I get out of that? Is it going to be all free territory or what we'll later call free soil, area where there is no expansion of, of slavery into the territory? Or is it area that we will ne negotiate and designate as being open to slavery? So when you come to me with this idea of manifest destiny a bit and you, you want a foreign war to expand the United States, understand that my first question as a Southerner is how much land does the northern free interest of America get? And how much land does the southern slave interest of America get? That's a sectional attitude that says, here's this national issue of politics, but I like to see it from a background of my region or my section, the South. Okay? I also add that generally speaking, Southerners tended to rely on rivers for transport. If I'm a Southerner looking at the United States of America, one of the big pushes that the other regions of the nation is going to say is we should fund a national system of roads. We should tax people in all of the states and the territories in order to make a system of roads. And I, as a Southerner, am going to say, no thanks. I don't need your roads down here. I've got rivers. Uh, for the record, I don't need your tariff 
right? The Southerners are going to be deeply opposed to the tariff on many levels because it doesn't help them. I'm a Southerner. I make the world's cheapest cotton. Cotton. You can't make it any cheaper than we do down here. And as a result of that, I don't need a tariff, right? Think of it this way. The English are going to send shirts to America, right? They, they are. They're going to send cheap shirts to America, and they're going to flood the textile market. That's why we need a tariff to protect northern shirts. The English are not going to send cotton to America. They are not going to take Egyptian or Indian-made cotton and haul it across an ocean or two oceans and plunk it down to America and be like, that's cheap cotton, because it isn't. We have the cheapest cotton. So if I'm a southerner, I look at the tariff issue and I say to you, I don't need a tariff. I don't need you to raise money in that sense. I don't need a national system of roads. You know what I need? I need someone to find us more land for the expansion of the economic institution that is the backbone of our lifestyle. That's the Southern view, okay? The Northeast, sharply differing in the sense that the Northeast tends to see America through their manufacturing mindset. In their eyes, a tariff, necessary. A system of national roads and canals, necessary to move people, to move goods, to, to be able to make sure that not just immigration and migration of people happens, but that goods move across the landscape quickly. That's an important factor if I'm someone who lives in the Northeast. Likewise, the Northwest. Okay, the Northwest, in this sense, I'm not talking about Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington. I'm talking about areas like Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan. That's the Northwest of the day. And in those areas, we tended to make food products, and the United States was you know, building this economy that was very strong, both in the Northeast and in the Northwest, in the manufacturing world. Both of those areas would support the building of a national system of roads and canals, and, and in essence, anything that's going to link them together, right? That's what I need. I need roads that are going to make a very strong set of networks. Think about like, I don't know if you know Bakersfield geography all that well, but think about the 58. The 58 goes out of town here, goes to Tehachapi, goes over the top of the Tehachapi Mountains, and eventually makes its way out to Barstow where it hits some bigger freeways. But in that sense, it is an enormously important road. There is no other road in California where you can leave the West Coast and get over the mountains, unless you're going on the 58, you can go north through Tahoe, you can go south around Los Angeles, but in the entire valley, the 58 is your road. And so that road is an incredibly important network. When it shuts down, you're in trouble. Roads matter in that sense, okay? So if I'm someone who lives in the Northwest, someone who lives in the Northeast, it's a really important thing for me to have that system of roads. Now, what Southerners would object to, let's go back to this, and I know I'm beating this topic up, but I wanna make sure we get a, a full verse of it. What Southerners would object to is the federal level of the taxation. A Southerner would say to you, wait a minute, a road in California, let's stay with California, in California, I'll never see it, I'll never walk on it, drive on it, anything on it. I shouldn't have to pay for it. If you, a Californian, want to build a road, build a road. But don't ask me, a Southerner, to pay for it. Right? That's what Southerners object to in this grand national system of railroads or roads and canals, is they don't like a national system here. Southerners, and realize that this is the, the, por the portion of the country that really believes in kind of the, the local rule, that Jeffersonian idea. Southerners are going to say, let the states build the roads, not the national government. We're not against roads. If you want to have a road, have a road. If, if five states want to have a road that goes from the far western point of one to the far eastern point of the other, I'll tell you what you do. State number one builds a road. State number two builds their own road, linking to state number one. State number three builds their own road. And you get the opinion, right? You get the idea. It should go all the way to the end, and there's a road. Now, it's owned by state one, state two, state three, state four, and state five, not by one big federal entity. That's the sort of discussion we're going to have as a nation as we start to build up here. Slavery is up for grabs in the sectional debate, as is the tariff, the building of a national system of transport. It is a sticky, sticky issue. And as I said, it's largely argued because of where you're from. No better representation of that than our last slide, the 1820 Missouri Compromise. Okay, 
Have a look at the map for a moment. And I, I don't know how big it is. Maybe you're looking at it on your phone or you've printed it. I've printed it quite small. In fact, I'm kicking myself for printing it so small. Next time, I won't fool myself so much. But if you look at this map, prior to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, there are 11 slave states and 11 free states. And the balance of those was considered to be an important thing. In other words, the nation believed that in order to keep the power, particularly in the Senate, where each state gets two senators, equal that the number of slave states and the number of free states should be in accord with one another. That is to say, at this point, 11 and 11. Here's the problem. In 1820, the state of Missouri, that's Missouri all the way on the far western part, on the left. Sometimes I, I say western and my students go, right or left? Left, okay? Pardon me. There's Missouri there. Now, Missouri is the first portion of the Louisiana Territory to apply for statehood. And Missouri wants to be a slave state. There's slavery in Missouri. So here's a couple of reasons why this raises the national level of uh-oh. Number one, if Missouri comes in as a slave state, the total of slave states goes from 11 to 12. And the number of free states remains at 11, and the free states are going to say, wait a moment, we've got a problem with that. So that's concern number one. Concern number two, if Missouri comes in as a slave state, will the entire Louisiana Purchase be slave? Now, when I say that, looking at this map, the area that is tagged here, unorganized territory, that's the bigger portion of the Louisiana Territory. It also includes this area here we're talking about that says Arkansas Territory in it. It's a big stretch. So are you saying that all of that would be slave territory or would there be some sort of a split? What's the future hold? So those two issues all of a sudden come clanging into the national level, right? I said a moment ago, looking back at this last slide, that if you looked at the Electoral College in 1820, you thought, man, we're all on the same page. This can be easy. But it isn't that way. It's incredibly contentious. And there is a national fear that this debate over slavery is going to crack the nation apart. And here's what's more. We're going to have more debates like this. Every time a free state or a slave state walks down the aisle, there's going to be a national debate. And the, the, the real feeling is how many times can we have this row before we end up breaking the nation apart over slavery or free soil? Right? Compare it to this, and maybe your family never has these. Maybe you're not that family. But some families, there are some topics we don't talk about. We don't sit down at Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter, or whatever a big meal is in your family, and suddenly have the discussion like, well, I'm going to talk about this. And the reason you don't is because you're going to make the place go up in flames. It'll be horrible. That's what the nation's afraid of a major disagreement that is going to, at its root, destroy the country, especially if we have to drag it out and discuss it every time we get a new state. So what they do with the Missouri Compromise, this is why it's particularly brilliant, is they put to rest a couple of different issues. So here's the Missouri Compromise. Number one, Missouri would enter the nation as a slave state. Total number of slave states goes from 11 to 12. Briefly, there are more slave states than free states, but we'll take care of that. How? We will create a new free state in Maine. Maine, in case you don't know where Maine is, you should know where Maine is. It's in the upper right-hand portion of the United States, the far northeast. Up until now, the state that we know as Maine was a portion of the state of Massachusetts. It was like a, a separate clump of it. And now it's being carved off as its own state. So the number of free states would go from 11 to 12 as well. Slave states, 12. Free states, 12. Perfect. And here's the real beautiful part. In the future, any territory that becomes a state in the area of the Louisiana Purchase is a free state if its territory is north of the southern border of Missouri. What the heck? That's complicated. This is why a video is a good thing. You're going to stop it and play that back a couple times. I know you are. That's fine. Okay, so let me say that again, and let's look at it. On your map, it says the 3630 Missouri Compromise Line. If your territory is north of that, that is going to be a free state. On the other hand, if your territory is south of it, that is going to be a slave state. 
Okay, so you have here then a, a big chunk of land, if you like, to the west and to the north of Missouri that's set aside for free states. And to the south of Missouri and a little bit west of it, you have what's called the Arkansas Territory that that's set aside for slave states. And people in 1820 breathed a collective, we got through. We didn't tear the country apart. And now we know for the foreseeable future that we won't have a national disagreement over the expansion of slave and free states because every inch of American soil that we have anyway is set aside as being either slave or free. Here's the problem for the future, though. Look to the west of the Missouri Compromise land, or I beg your pardon, the, the Louisiana Purchase land, New Spain, Mexico. That's territory that very freshly has gone from being Spanish being owned by the newly independent Mexico. And if I look into the far corner, the Oregon country, that's territory where there are Americans living there already. There are Russians living there. There are British people living there. But the nation has aspirations. We're looking at all of this open land and thinking, yeah, that'd be nice. Okay, we, we could take that. That would be great. The only problem is that it's going to cause a debate over the expansion of slave and free land. So the idea of manifest destiny, which we get to in a couple of weeks here, would support the idea of pushing the country to the west across the landscape. But the important thing is, if we're going to do that, then we have to have a conversation about the expansion of slave and free states. And we just don't know how many more of those we can have before this breaks apart. And, and you think to yourself, is that really a concern? Well, it eventually does break the place apart. So let's, that, that, that is a legitimate thing. All right, which brings me to the end of our material for this afternoon or this evening, whenever you happen to be watching this. Uh, I'm going to show the, the pictures again here of the questions. So let me disconnect my phone, which by now I think has revived itself to happiness. Let me put that above the questions there and hopefully that helps you to see them. I thank you for everything, folks. I hope you're doing well. If there's anything I can do, I hope you'll reach out. Otherwise, take care of yourselves out there.